Hello everyone, I'm Abhishek Shindre, Principal Software Engineer from D2S. Today, I'm going to present a talk on why you don't need to sample curvilinear contours at every one nanometer and how pixel-based computing is going to help you with that. I'm the lead author on this paper. My uh, CEO, Aki, and my colleagues, uh, Mariusz and Tom, are my co-authors. Aki, Tom, and I are also part of the curvilinear format committee for semi-standards. Semiconductor mass shapes can be represented in three different forms. You have the piecewise linear format, you have the curvilinear format, and you also have the pixel-based formats. The piecewise linear format, which is the legacy formats like uh, OASIS or GDS formats, are very efficient to represent Manhattan geometries. However, it becomes really inefficient when you're trying to represent curvilinear geometries because of the data explosion. In uh, curve-based formats, you can really represent um, the curvilinear geometries very efficiently. It reduces the data volume required to save on disk, and in general, it provides you the same accuracy as the piecewise layer uh, linear format. And that's why D2S supports the industry's effort towards an efficient Bezier-based curve representation. The uh, pixel-based format can also be another option for representing curvilinear mass shapes. It represents the natural language of multi-beam mass writers. It does require a lot, amount, a lot of data to represent uh, the same mask, but it can really be efficient in doing some of the internal computings. So some of the internal computings that are done today are already using this format. In fact, pixel-based computing is used in all kinds of graphical tools and simulation tools. It is in your movies, it's also in your uh, general CAD tools for weather simulation, it's in your games, it's in your CGI's, and it's also part of uh, the uh, industry, the semiconductor industry. It's used in ILT simulations, e-beam simulations, mask inspections, and many other things. The most advanced masks written today are written using pixels. They are written using the multi-beam mask writers. What the mask writer receives is an input design. This input design then undergoes rasterization, which is a process of converting the vector shapes into some form of uh, pixel dose area coverage map. Uh, the rasterization is a crucial step because it makes the writer know how much dose to put at a particular location on mask. In fact, rasterization is just digital sampling of vector shapes. It has roots in digital signal processing. Just like uh, in audio processing, you have to sample the audio, audio data in 1D. In case of rasterization, you are sampling the uh, vector shapes into 2D map of pixels. So it has to adhere to the Nyquist criteria, which basically says it needs to capture all the data. In order to capture all the data, you need to sample at uh, 2x the frequency. It also adheres to the information theory, which among other things says that the minimum volume of data required to represent something is indeed limited by the information contained in that data. Contour geometries and pixels are duals. Whatever you can do in one domain can also be done in the other domain, provided, of course, that you satisfy the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. Data volume looks like it would explode in case of curvilinear geometry, but uh, the amount of information is really limited because this data is band limited. And if this data is going to get rasterized, the information content in this data is also limited. So the information content in any kind of rasterization that follows the 2D sampling of the vector shapes would actually be dependent on the number of pixels or the size of pixels. We give it a small notation, uh, like in computer science term, we call it uh, big O of P, which is basically uh, big o, the complexity is directly proportional to the number of pixels on a given mask. In order to get some intuition of uh, how Nyquist rate affects the sampling into pixel uh, space, uh, let's look at this example where uh, you have the same data across different grid alignments. Uh, I'm using an equal line space pattern for this example, where uh, the width and the space is equal to a pixel size, and it's just aligned at different alignments 
Um, as you can see, the leftmost example, it shows uh, that it's a perfect alignment where um, you have, after rasterization, alternate pixels of ones and zeros. It's easy to figure out where the edge is once you look at the data after rasterization. So uh, this is not an issue. But if you have another case where the alignment is 50% uh, or, or you can just call it a perfect misalignment, you can see that after rasterization, everything is just 0.5. What 0.5 would mean is that everything is just 50% dose. This is very ambiguous as you cannot really discern where the edge is. And uh, if you cannot discern, even the ma machine when it's trying to write this kind of data, it's just going to blur everything out. You can also see that even at 80-20% uh, alignment, uh, although the rasterization produces a pixels, uh, pixel rows of uh, uh, 0.8s and 0.2s, um, it's still ambiguous as 0.8s and 0.2s can also be represented using the other data which is shown on the right side. So you can really say that you really require Nyquist rate to sample this. And for this reason, the Nyquist trace rate says that uh, the sampling needs to be greater than 2x and not just greater than or equal to 2x. The exact location of the vertex is never used for any com uh, computation of wafer quality. And you will never, it will never be used for writing a mask and it will not even be used for inspecting the mask because there are really no sharp corners in reality. So there is no accurate polygon when you are trying to represent something either in reality or in pixel domain. In fact, this red curve that you are seeing here is also going to represent the same pixel values as the original blue curve. So rasterization is inherently acting like a low pass filter. As far as we are in pixel domain, the red and the blue have exactly the same pixelization uh, because of the rasterization process, because uh, of something that we call pixel dose equivalence. Therefore, there is really an upper bound on how many vertices you can re you are really required to represent any shape. And this bound is approximately the contour parameter over pixel size. A shape such as the red one is not reputably or reliably manufacturable. So when we are designing something, we need to think uh, this through and figure out the exact shapes that we want to represent on mask. And these shapes need to be curvilinear. So we are limited by what multi-beam mask writers can write. The size of the pixel used for the multi-beam mask writing uh, dictates the smallest feature size. Let's look at the three examples, A, B, and C here. The example A, it's a large enough polygon that across all alignments, it will uh, be discernible that it's a circle, uh, even after rasterization. However, the examples B and C, they are subpixel. So even if we move the circle around, it's representing the same pixel values. And because of this, uh, you cannot really distinguish between what's B and what's C. Here again, Nyquist rate is the key. And uh, this issue will still exist even if the mask undergoes any kind of mask process correction. On the other hand, information content is also limited in ILT simulations. Consider an ILT mask that's been created using some ILT software either through iterative optimization or through some other process like uh, uh, the T2S's uh, true mask ILT. We have to simulate this mask in order to validate it so that it can be sent to the mask shop. To the uh, application engineer or the, just the user interface, it looks like you, when you do the wafer simulation, you are just moving the edges. But in reality, what's really happening in the backend calculations is that you're converting the data into raster data. You're doing fast Fourier transform on it to compute the wafer simulation and once you have the wafer simulation done, you contour it, and that's the simulated contour that you actually see. It's then tested against the target and sent to the mask shop after validation. So uh, it's really using pixels here. In fact, 
the speed and accuracy of any curvy ILT is going to be a function of the underlying grid size. The smallest circle that can be represented reliably using ILT computation is also a function of this pixel size. And the curvature of that circle is also a function of this pixel size. So pixel-based computing also limits the information content in ILT computation. In fact, there is a contract between OPC shop and the mass shop. The ILT or OPC shop needs to follow the mask rules. It cannot describe any shape that doesn't follow the mask rules because they will not be reliably manufacturable. On the other hand, mask shops should accurately print the mask that was described as per the mask rules. Demanding precise EPE for curvy data isn't really necessary in this case, if, especially when you're using um, multi-beam mask writers. Pixel dose equivalence is what's more important. It's more important than EPE. Reliably transferring the dose information to the mask is the key. The mask writer only cares about the dose. It only needs to know how much dose to put at a certain location. The mask data needs to accurately convey this dose information. If you are giving anything more, it's just going to be wasteful. And if you are giving anything less, it's going to be inaccurate. You can see that this piecewise linear curvy format uh, has uh, uh, a lot of vertices to represent a very accurate pixel value. You can also represent the same data using any curve format and uh, or produce the same pixel value. Here, you are conveying the same information, but uh, while doing so, you're using much less data and thus you're not overloading the data path. And as long as you are accurately conveying the ultimate dose that is going to be projected on the mask, it should be sufficient. So pixel-based computing can and should be used at every step to maintain the information integrity. You have the ILT that's, in pix that's using pixels. You have the mask writers that are using pixels, the metrology and the inspection and repair tools that are using pixels. The only thing that may not be using pixels is the offline MPC. However, if you use MBM2000 with PLDC, you would not require offline MPC. And PLDC is a GPU-accelerated, pixel-based, real-time mass process correction and edge enhancement software. So since it's in pixel domain, it already adheres to the information integrity part of it. As a lead engineer, on this software, I can confirm that it has been validated by actual mask rights. It eliminates the need of offline MPC completely. And because it is pixel based, you do have uh, the information integrity. So since the mask generator, as well as the mask writer, they both use the pixels, you can say information theory bounds all mask computations. Information beyond what ILT uses is irrelevant and information beyond what MBM writers can write is going to be wasted. It doesn't matter whether you use the red curve or the blue curve. As long as both of them translate to the same mask data, that is translate to the same raster pixels, it's going to project the same mask by construction because all the mask writer uh, needs is to project the dos described by these shapes. And if the doses are exactly the same, then by construction, it's going to produce the same mask. So you can represent the same data using curvilinear format and reduce the unnecessary burden of on the data pad due to oversampling the red, red curve. So pixel dose equivalence should be sufficient the maximum number of vertices that are really required to present anything uh, accurately on pixels is going to be a function of contour perimeter over pixel size. For mask writers uh, with 16 nanometer pixels, the sampling interval required is roughly 16 man nanometers on mask or maybe four nanometers on wafer, and if you want the wafer numbers. So we don't really need one nanometer segment polygons to represent one, any mask. 
Uh, here one nanometer is just a metaphor for oversampling. It can be a different number. So uh, what I really mean is uh, sampling the polygon at a rate that really uh, understands the information integrity part of it and understands that this is going to be uh, uh, processed by a pixel-based system is important. And uh, representing the data uh, using sampling in the order of multi-beam mass writer pixel sizes should be more than sufficient because the information uh, in this data is actually band limited by the pixel-based computing. Thank you. Thank you so much.